Why does this film exist? I mean, you have to wonder what was going through the minds of Sony producers when this film got greenlighted. Okay, fellow Sony executive, Spider-Man 4 isn't happening and McGuire and Raimi are out. So, I believe, given the popularity of the Marvel Universe and because we'll lose the rights to Spider-Man anyway in a few years, we should sell the rights to Spider-Man back to Marvel to see what they can do with the character. <laughs> are you fucking mad? Think of all the money we'll be out of! But, 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 but I, I think... I would rather super glue my butt cheeks together and proceed to binge at Taco Bell than sell Spider-Man. He's our hottest property, you dickweed! <laughs> Sorry. What, what are our options here? How can we retain the rights? Well, we could reboot the franchise. We can reboot the franchise? Well, yeah. And this will make it so that Spider-Man stays his only property? Well, yeah, but Spider-Man 3 came out in 2007. It's far too early for a reboot. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't go in like that. Say, um, how's your um, wife and child doing lately? It would be a shame if anything were to um, happen to them. We'll, we'll reboot Spider-Man. I'm glad you've seen reason. Nah, Sony's not like that. They're the most righteous and trustworthy company out there. I mean, let's have a look at a random piece of Sony commercialism to see what an amazing company they are. Okay, apparently Sony are fucked in the head. And that's in more ways than one people. Spider-Man 3 came out in 2007. The Amazing Spider-Man came out in 2012. You don't reboot a franchise after only five years, guys. I mean, what's next? Batman getting rebooted in an even shorter time span. We've got to have money. <sighs> Man, this is the way Hollywood is now, unfortunately. Any sort of geeky property which caters towards a young male demographic brings in serious box office dollars these days. And as long as a big name like Spider-Man continues to shit out the Benjamins, more films will be made about him. However, there is a bright side to the superhero reboot phase we seem to be in right now, as there's a lot of genuine effort and talent put into these reimagined films. I mean, today's movie, for example, has a lot of capable names attached to it, like Golden Globe winner Martin Sheen, two-time Oscar winner Sally Field, Golden Globe nominees Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone, BAFTA nominee that dude who played as Lovegood, and the director's last name is Webb. <laughs> what could go wrong? Oh, uh, reviews for this were actually kind of divisive. Huh. Well, it would appear we have something to find out here then. Will the Amazing Spider-Man get my spidey sense tingling? Or will they make me want to bust out a kind of red? Let's find out. This is the Amazing Spider-Man. So our movie begins in a flashback as the Parker family's house has been broken into. So Richard and Mary here leave their son Peter to live with his aunt and uncle. And yeah, that's the flashback. <laughs> Bit redundant. You know, considering the most memorable thing about it is the strange way Richard Parker says goodbye. Are you stuck or something, mate? Oh god, son. I need a rush of every suit to go again. Yeah, get your nails on us, I can't get out. So yeah, we cut roughly a decade later, you know, because apparently nothing interesting happened in that time, as we're introduced to a 17-year-old Peter Parker, played by the man with the greatest hairline in the world, Andrew Garfield. <laughs> Sorry. Morning, Flash. Good morning, Parker. <laughs> Okay, so this is immediately what I don't get about Andrew Garfield as Peter Parker. So he gets picked on by bullies like in the Raimi film, but with Tom and Maguire, you bullied why the bullies did this. Because Maguire's Peter was a loser. He dressed like a nerd, what with his parted hairstyle and glasses, he couldn't hold a conversation to save his life, and by god he cried so much I think his tears alone could supply me with enough water to power a hydroelectrically powered home for a week. Garfield, on the other hand, is like God's gift to women. Don't believe me? Then take a look at some of these comments on Reddit I found out about him. These, by the way, are 100% legitimate. 
His attractiveness was borderline distracting. I feel like my love for him is approaching dangerous levels. And quite possibly the quote which proves women are as horny as men. Safe to say that I was wet a good quarter of the movie. Ew! That's bloody disgusting. Sheesh. I mean, these comments, people, they are not things that should be said about the nerdy Dan and his look, Peter Parker. <laughs> yeah, I know. Alright, so I think I've established that this guy should be getting more ass in a toilet seat, but I digress. Peter heads outside and after taking a photo of one Gwen Stacy without asking permission, hello, disturbing character trait, he runs into Flash who's spending his time forcing little kids to eat their vegetables. Good God, can I be like any kid his age and just smoke a joint during break? Man, if I was at this school, I'd be bullying him. Put him down, Eugene! Yep, a mixture of super glue, peanuts and brown paint would be going on his seat in no time. That's horrible. Hey. Come on, get up, Parker! Get up, come on! <sighs> okay, it's official. Hollywood does not understand high school. First of all, there is no way this many people would support a bully and egg him on like this. Unless you were like in Pyongyang or something. Secondly, where the fuck are the teachers? Thirdly, why is no one helping up Peter for sticking up for a defenseless kid? I mean, Gwen here respects him for his actions, but no one helps him up. Even the kid he helped is fucked off, no thank you or anything ungrateful or shit. And lastly, like in the Raimi film, everyone looks 25. Why does Hollywood find this so difficult? If you want teenagers in your film, you need to cast teenagers. Chris Zilker, the actor playing Flash here, was born in 1985, which would make him around 27 when filming this. A whole 10 years older than his character. And Garfield is even worse. He was 29! A 29 year old actor playing a 17 year old character? The fuck is this shit? Look, I'm not saying Peter Parker has to be played by a young actor, but if he isn't, don't write him in as a high school student. At 29, he should be like a university major or something, and even that's pushing it, seeing as how I graduated uni at 21. Besides, we've already seen a live-action high school Peter Parker. We saw it only 10 years ago. Tell you what, let's keep count of that. Let's count how many times this film repeats what the Raimi film did. Because a franchise that only waited three years since its last film to get a reboot green light should have a shitload of new ideas to bring to the table. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. So Peter and Gwen here, played by Emma Stone, quickly become acquainted. Assumedly because they're the only non assholes in this school. As Pete heads home as we're introduced to Aunt May, played by Sally Field, and Uncle Ben, played by Martin Sheen. I put odds of Uncle Ben dying in this movie as 10 to... 10. What happened to you? It fell. Why you kids ride those things, I'll never know. Because it's stupid and dangerous. Remember when we were stupid and dangerous? No. Trust me, we were. <laughs> yeah, I was stupid and dangerous once. I once played a drinking game where I watched Eurovision and I had to take a shot every time the presenter told an unfunny joke. I don't know how I survived. So Pete and Uncle Ben head down to the basement to fix a condenser when Pete notices a mysterious briefcase belonging to his father. He takes it upstairs and finds a bunch of documents which contain a strange algorithm. But before he can make much out, Uncle Ben comes in for a chat. You okay? Yeah, what's up? God, you look just like him. I mean, I'm surprised Uncle Ben didn't make more of a uh, assumption walking in this room. I mean, we have here a pubescent male sitting in his room with a locked door with pictures of Emma Stone on his computer. <sighs> Too easy. <laughs> so Uncle Ben explains to Peter that his father was working with a man called Kurt Connors. So Peter does some research and finds out that he and Richard Parker were working on a new breakthrough in cross-species genetics at the Oscorp building. So Peter disguises himself as an intern to get in. Here he meets up with Gwen. Hello, Major Plot Convenience, how you doing? Hey, I'm alright. We then quickly meet up with Dr. Curtis Connors, played by Reese fans. If I'm pronouncing that wrong, feel free to cash me in the comment section. But like the Parkinson's patient who watches on in horror as her body slowly betrays her, or the man with macular degeneration whose eyes grow dimmer each day, I long to fix myself. I want to create a world without weakness. A world without pitbull guest verses and YouTube commenters writing stupid things like... First. Anyone care to venture a guess just how? Yes. Stem cells? Promising. 
but the solution I'm thinking of is more radical. We plan to take natural selection into our own hands. No one? Cross species genetics. A person gets Parkinson's when the brain cells that produce dopamine start to disappear. But a zebrafish has the ability to regenerate cells on command. If you could somehow give this ability to the woman you're talking about, that's that. She's she's curing herself. Wow, this kind of thinking opens up a whole bunch of possibilities. To give an ability of an animal to a human. For example, we could give the regenerative ability of a lizard to a wounded war veteran. We could give the camouflage ability of a chameleon to our soldiers out in the field. And we could give the lifespan of a mayfly to Miley Cyrus' music career. Why are we not funding this? So Peter separates himself from the group and runs into a man who has documents with the same symbol as fathers did. So he follows him to a room with a very strange keypad. There is no way he could replicate that sequence when he saw it from that far away. Especially when Pete and his glasses to see properly. Also, am I the only one who finds it hard to believe that Oscorp, a leading name in scientific research which has displayed technology beyond our years and door security that rivals that of international airports, has chosen not to install any security cameras? So by that shit, Peter goes through the door and spots a room inside with hundreds of spiders. <laughs> I like that. Hmm, super secret room full of hundreds of spiders whose venom level I can't predict and a bite of one could possibly leave me sick, paralyzed, or even killed. Let's go in! Okay, so Peter gets bitten. I mean, at least with the Raimi film, this wasn't by fault of him, so this Peter's an idiot. As we see Peter heading home, where he runs into some goons on the subway. Oh man, no, not my board. Please do ah! not. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Go back. Please do not. Why does this black guy all of a sudden transform into a white guy? So, yeah, after Peter's encounter with race change man, he heads home to our worried uncle and aunt. Sorry, I'm late. I got... I'm so worried. I know, I'm sorry. What the fuck? That's a fly, Peter. Show off. Drinking? I don't think so. You know what, Uncle Ben is right. Cold sweat, jittery behavior, large appetite. My first conclusion would be Spider-Man on drugs. <laughs> so Pete heads upstairs when we get this scene as Pete tries to climatize with his powers. And I personally always find this scene hilarious. I imagine it as if Spider-Man is kind of like the Doctor and he's trying to now repress memories of his previous self or something. You are really gonna dig this joint. Huh? Now dig all this. Find us some shade. Thanks, Hot Mics. So Peter Short announces so he heads to Kurt Connor's house to see what he knows. I don't know how he found his address, unless Peter put his stalkerish skills to more practical use, but I digress. I'm afraid I can't help you much, Peter. I don't know why they left or where they were going. Good reflexes. Wow, great reflexes. So you, you really think it's possible, cross-species genetics? Yes, of course, but for years your father and I were mocked for our theories, not just in the community at large, but at Oscorp as well. They called us mad scientists. Hmm, I kind of wonder if there was a reason for that. 
And I was mocked for my theories, Peter, and I have no idea why. For example, I had this ingenious idea of combining a human with the DNA of an elephant. That way we would never forget. So Peter gives Connors the Decaria algorithm, he takes credit for it for some reason, I don't really know why, as we cut to school the next day where Peter has just made fun of Flash in the basketball court. Hmm, seeing where Peter gets revenge on a bully? That sounds familiar. Was that true? What? When I heard in there just now, did you humiliate that boy? Yes, that boy who beats people up, has clear anger management issues and gets a kick out of mocking innocent little kids on the playground. Did you humiliate him? Yeah, I did. How dare you? But Gwen appears as Uncle Ben shows up Peter like he's some perverted creep. Well, he actually kind of is, but that's not very nice. He, um, he's a pathological liar and he thought you were someone else. Oh, man, you don't have me on your computer. <laughs> wow, she's taking that disturbing bit of news surprisingly well. Gwen, you have no idea what this guy gets up to in his free time. Based upon his current behaviour, I hate to think what his theme song would sound like. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, voyeurism is his plan. Hide your garments, hide your shoes, he'll sniff them out like their perfume. Look out! Look out! He is the Creeper Man! But Andrew Garfield is so dreamy, so therefore he gets away with it. Even if he is a 29 year old actor who has the hearts for a 17 year old character. So, so, something's not right there. So after that scene, we cut back to Oscorp as Peter and Kurt are just about to try out Richard's algorithm. What you see here is a computer model of a lizard. <sighs> Many of these wonderful creatures have so brilliantly adapted that they can regenerate entire limbs at will. You can imagine my envy. I can, though I imagine one Theon Greyjoy would be more envious. Well, Reek would be more envious. So the algorithm works as animal trials begin and a couple of mice named Fred and Wilma. Pete then heads home as it turns out he was supposed to pick up Aunt May that night and as a result she was forced to walk home. Uh oh, uh, we now go live to Ollie Williams for the punishment forecast. How's it looking for Peter, Ollie? He gon' get it! Thanks, Ollie. Look, I'm sorry, Uncle Ben. I uh, got distracted. Oh, you got distracted. Yeah. Your aunt, my wife, had to walk 12 blocks alone in the middle of the night and then wait in a deserted subway station because you got distracted. Ben, sweetheart. Couldn't she have just taken a cab? I mean, it's New York City. There's cabs fucking everywhere. Okay. Hang on a minute. How was Peter supposed to pick up Aunt May in the first place? Peter doesn't own a car or any mode of transport for that matter. Unless you include his skateboard. Even Maguire had that little moped, but Garfield's got squat. Hello, movie. How in the name of Spidey Suit Chafe Max was he supposed to pick her up? That's what's at stake here. Not choice, responsibility. Ah, oh, man. And they felt they need to include a responsibility speech somehow. You know what? This seems pissing me off. I'm just gonna edit and make it look like it's an episode of Jerry Springer. What's going on? He didn't think it was his responsibility to be here to tell me this himself. Oh. Oh, oh come on. How dare you? How dare I? How dare you? Oh, okay. Oh. F you. Oh. Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. So Peter bails and heads to a shop, though the store clerk refuses to serve him because he's shot two cents. You can leave a penny anytime. You have to spend ten dollars to take a penny. Store policy. The next customer though robs the place as Peter sees this as divine intervention. Somebody stop that guy! Hey kid, little help. Not my policy. I missed the part where that's my problem. So Uncle Ben follows, and uh, you know, this scene is looking incredibly familiar to that scene in the Raimi film, but uh. Nah, I, I, they can't be stupid enough to kill Uncle Ben again when we only saw it 10 years ago. Personally, I think it'd be quite interesting to see a Spider-Man story where Uncle Ben survived. This is obviously a misleading ploy and something unexpected will happen. Oh, man, you know what? You, you've seen the movie, you know where this joke is going. I'm just going to kill him myself. <laughs> I think they'll just figure something out. 
three character scenarios in film which will tell you if a character is certain to die or not. So, a character will definitely die if either A, the character's name is Uncle Ben, B, the character is played by Sean Bean, or C, they're a comic relief character in a Michael Bay film. No, sorry, my bad. That last one isn't that the character will die, it's that the character should die. I apologise. I noticed that. So yeah, Uncle Ben dies. Surprise, surprise. As the police come in to interview Aunt May. There's one other thing. He has a star tattooed on his left hand. Whoa, 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 hold on. Two things, okay? One, that's a wrist, not a hand. And two, how do you know that? The only person who got a good look at the tattoo was Peter, so why are you telling this to the person who most likely told you? You know, movie, in this world there is a little thing called sense. Would you care to make some of it? So Pete takes his rather handy information as he vows revenge and heads out into the street to pick a fight with a random guy. Good plan! Your star tattooed on his left hand. Okay, thank you, movie. I think we all knew why Peter was looking at the wrist. You don't need to flash back to three minutes ago to explain. Even Guy Pierce and Memento could have remembered that. Something is very wrong. So Peter realises he needs a disguise, so he fashions himself the iconic Spidey suit to continue his search, but not before we get this strangely familiar scene. So yeah, next on Peter's agenda is for him to sneak into a car and ambush this car thief. How he got in the car is anyone's guess. Good thinking, good thinking. Use the window, get out the window. There you go, you got it. Whoa. <laughs> okay Spidey, in order to pull that trick off, you need to have the following qualities. You need to be rich, you need to have a black suit, and you must also feel the need to announce who you are on a regular basis. Only then are you allowed to disappear into thin air like that. But the police show up and... Okay, much trigger happy cop in history here. Thank God Spidey can dodge bullets like a fucking Matrix agent. Whoa. So Spidey gets chased by the cops and uh, yeah, like a bajillion of them appear out of nowhere. But luckily, Peter escapes. We then cut back to Kurt as he's shown what advancements he's made with the serum. Though time has run out as Dr. Ravi here fires him and takes the serum for himself. The formula is ours now anyway. Say goodbye to that arm you have dreamed of. I'm shutting you down. Oh, and yeah, we have here a scientist under pressure from a higher authority to perfect a formula. Sound fucking familiar? So because Kurt's been shut down, he injects the formula into himself as a last minute resort to see if the serum works on humans. And what do you know, it does, grows his arm right back. So he's inherited the power of an Amekian? Cool. But it turns out the serum has one tiny little side effect. It turns you into a giant raging 10 foot tall lizard. <laughs> so after Peter reveals to Gwen that he's the one who swings around in the city in tight spandex, Spidey meets the lizard on a bridge but gets distracted by the kid in danger. I'm gonna hold on. That's here. Okay, one, three. Okay, one, two, three. See how easy that was? How the hell did the car catch fire? What did a random Harry Potter character walk by the set? Jack, climb now! I can't! Yes, you can! <laughs> I like that. No, I can't climb. I'd rather sit here and burn to death. You, you know what? This kid's pissing me off. He's gone bye bye. No! Say hi and say Peter for me, kid! <laughs> ah, I'm going to hell. Alright, okay, Peter actually does save him. Though, I don't know, maybe having this kid die on him would have made an interesting story dynamic. I mean, that would have made it different from that other scene where Spidey is hanging onto something from a bridge. But, I digress, as the next day, Peter heads to Oscorp to see if Connors knows how to stop the lizard. Little does he know, of course, that Connors is the lizard. It's not nice to snoop. <laughs> is it just me or is that inject to look like a lightsaber handle? God, I'm such a nerd. But Pete notices that the mouse that was injected with the formula earlier has mutated itself. 
Though I do have to question why this took so long when Kurt transformed only about an hour after his injection. Well, regardless, this is all the evidence Peter needs to pinpoint Kurt as the lizard yeah. as he rushes back to the police station to tell Captain Stacy. But you would have me believe that he, in his spare time, is running around dressed up like a giant dinosaur. Not dressing up and not a dinosaur, he has transformed himself into a giant lizard. Peter, you didn't think it might have been a better idea to, um, ease that in a little better? That's what she said! Shut up, Bender. Woo! Let me ask you a question. Do I look like the mayor of Tokyo to you? Yeah, Peter. Because if I was the mayor of Tokyo, this story about a man who injected himself with a genetic serum and transformed himself into a giant raging green lizard, well, suddenly it'd be believable. Yeah, if um, anybody wanted to find out some stuff, then all they'd have to do would be to follow the lizards. That will lead them right. That's all I have to say. So because Peter is no proof of the lizards' existence, he decides to head down to the sewers so he can get the first picture of him. Mm. So, you're telling me, in the age where practically everyone owns a smartphone, with cameras in them that rival SLR quality, and in the city that never sleeps, which has thousands upon thousands of CCTV cameras in circulation, not one image of the lizard was taken? Obi-Wan, I need a bullshit count. The reading is off the chart. Over 20,000. Damn, even the nuke in the fridge scene from Crystal Skull didn't have a bullshit count that high. No scene has. What does that mean? I'm not sure. I'm referencing the Phantom Menace to highlight how stupid something is. That alone is kind of worrying. But the bullshit doesn't stop there. Because the lizard attacks and Peter gets away. Only for the lizard to come across this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, he left a prop here, Peter Parker, label on his camera? Peter, you arachnids asshole, you're supposed to be concealing your identity. That's why you wear the mask. So why in the name of the lizard's dick skin sheddings would you carry around something that can identify who you are? Well, it's official, Peter. You have the mental and cognitive capacity of a grade F bottom of his class 10 year old. And I know this because one such individual made the exact same mistake. But I bet you're stupid enough to have left a property of Bart Simpson label on that radio. <laughs> so yeah, because the lizard now knows that Spider-Man is Peter, he pays him a polite visit at school. <laughs> All these souls, lost and alone, I can save them, I can cure them. And to the lizard I bequeath a boot to the head. But Gwen shows up and gives Peter the opportunity he needs to wrap things up. I'm gonna throw you out the window now. <laughs> Bloody hell, it's lucky he caught her. I'm gonna throw you out the window now. So Spider gets knocked on his ass as the lizard takes its vital advantage and leaves. Uh, did Mama Lizard cock his dinner's ready or something? I mean, what the fuck? Why did he go back to the sewers? Well, get this. There's actually a deleted scene which shows that the lizard transformed back into human form. And this leads to a whole scene where Kurt explains his motivations to Peter in his lab. He transforms back into the lizard. Dr. Rather shows up. He asks the question as to why the mutation worked on Peter but not on Kurt. The lizard kills Dr. Rather and then escapes into the city. Why was this scene caught? That's quite a lot of shit going down for a deleted scene. Well, okay, maybe it's not so bad. Uh, what happens in the theatrical cut? Well, to start with, Pete calls Gwen to cook up an antidote. Do you know how to run a serum? Yeah, I do it for condoms okay, all the time. Great, 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 okay. Listen, I need you to go to Oscorp. I need to access the cross species file. It's a blue serum. File one, two, three, eight, nine. Okay, got it. On my way. Fantastic, Gwen. So happy my love interest in this picture actually contributes to the story. 
as opposed to... <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, Gwen, apparently the New York sewage system has amazing cell phone coverage. Who knew? We're then see Pete, and uh, this is where the big change is. In this original cut, Peter just so happens to come across Connor's lab, where Connor just so happens to be missing, where his evil plan just so happens to be playing on a computer for anybody to see. Yeah, uh, whoever decided to delete that aforementioned scene, you're an idiot. And I say that because there's other deleted scenes for this one that really should have been included. Including a scene where we learn Kurt has a son, which would have helped us in understanding his need to have his arm back so he could hold his son and be a regular father. There's a scene where Kurt shows Peter the mass that grew his leg back, which served as a better transition for Peter getting back to work at Oscorp. But pfft, screw that, we can't have the movie going on for another... two minutes. So the lizard is on his way to Oscorp as he plans to use a contraption called a Ganali device to spread the lizard serum across Manhattan so we can turn its population into lizards. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just stupid. That's like a planet Adam West Batman villain would have. Holy herpetology, Spider-Man. The lizard plans to use a Ganali device to turn all the folks in this fine city into giant mutated lizards. To Oscorp! <laughs> so Pete rushes to Oscorp, but Captain Stacy's SWAT team are on route too, as they capture Spidey. But Pete manages to kick their asses, but Stacy has got him at gunpoint. Freeze! Your head. Uh, what's the big deal, Pete? Did you forget you can dodge bullets? Hold your fire! Uh, what the, wait a minute! So Pete can dodge one, two, three, four bullets at point blank range. Yet here we have one bullet shot several yards away and it hits him. And don't tell me he couldn't dodge them because he was in midair, because he has no problem with that in the sequel. Spidey, your powers are as consistent as my upload schedule. That's pretty bad. So because Spidey's injured, he's struggling to reach Oscorp. But get this, because this gives the bridge scene in the first Raimi film a run for its money when measuring it on the cheese scale. Remember that father of the kid Spidey said earlier? Turns out he's a construction worker, so he calls all his fellow workmen to all collectively point their cranes over a city street, so Spidey has a clear swing path to Oscorp. <laughs> Where do I begin? Okay. Firstly, it's a pretty damn major coincidence that this guy in particular is in this profession and that this moment just so happens to be during his work hours. Secondly, and speaking of work hours, how is this many construction workers working at the same time and all on the bloody same street? Thirdly, why does Spidey even need this? Can't he just attach his webs to the sides of the buildings? Isn't that what he always does? I don't see how a leg wound would make this any more difficult seeing as how your arms do all the work. And lastly, there's this. Today I learned Spiderweb makes a great wound sealer. But that brings up three more points. One, why didn't he do this earlier as he was trying to make his way up the building? Two, did he forget about the bullet that would be lodged in there right now? Sealing the wound now without first getting the bullet out is not a good idea. I mean, I suppose it could be a through and through, but if it was, why doesn't he seal the other side of his leg? And three, Peter does make his way to Oscorp, but after this scene, his leg somehow miraculously heals and he's perfectly fine. Okay, so Spidey in this film has so far confused his powers with Batman, Neo, and now Wolverine. Spider-Man, Spider-Man does whatever he feels like. So with the help of New York's construction force, and yeah, score another point here for the scene where the people help out Spidey in some way. Pete arrives at Oscorp. Initializing Ganali device. Detonation in T minus two minutes. Uh, why doesn't he just detonate it now? This movie should be freaking over. Initializing Ganali device. Detonation in one second. Son of a. <laughs> So, yeah, we need a climax, so Spidey and the Lizard face off, only for the Lizard to get Spidey in a hole. Poor Peter Parker. <laughs> nice alliteration there, Lizard. He uses the letter P so much that I'm surprised he didn't start spitting all over the place. Poor Peter Parker. All alone. He's not alone. 
Um, excuse me whilst I go into rage mode. What the fuck is Captain Stacy doing on his own? Last time we saw him, he had a fucking police helicopter and a SWAT team with enough firepower to take down the population of Luxembourg. And now he's... Uh, wait a minute. Oh, man. So, yeah, we have here Captain Stacy, a man who has just found out Spider-Man's identity in the first film. He has a loving and caring family, which proves he has a lot to lose. And now he's just arrived at where the villain is at, on his lonesome, in a manner that doesn't make any sense. Nah, I'm sure will be alright. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and then he just fell over and died. Bloody movie! Okay, so, bar that shit, Peter manages to install the antidote Gwen brewed up as the resulting clan cures Connors and everything's all hunky-dory. You know, apart from dead cop over here who tells Peter to leave Gwen out of his life to keep her safe. This is going to be awkward. Where have you been? I've been to London to visit the Queen. My father died. Oh, sorry. It was a funeral. Yeah, that's pretty much standard in every Spider-Man film at this point. You shut up. Rifles and they made speeches. I could make a speech. I thought your father was a... <laughs> Co courageous man, yes, I, uh, I won't be able to do him justice. <laughs> Tell my teacher shut up. Oh, why? I, I showed up. Barry Allen showed up? Everyone was there but you. Yeah, sorry about that. It was uh, kind of in my contract. What are you say? Uh, didn't you get the memo? You're my love interest. It's in our contract to break up at some point in this movie. So get the heck off my porch and act all heartbroken in this quite convenient rain we're having for this emotional scene. There you go. What a pretty girl. Did you ask her out? Can't. Why? I'm just no good for her. Peter Parker, if there's one thing you are, it's good. <laughs> what? I'm, I'm sorry, that line is terrible. If there's one thing you are, it's good. <laughs> I just can't believe two-time Oscar winner Sally Field said that. Anyone has a problem with that can talk to me. Yeah, Aunt May will kick your ass if you don't think Peter is... good. So this, on top of a little motivation from a text Uncle Ben left, gets Peter's spirit back up as we come to our final controversial line in the film. Mr. Parker. Hardy again. Well, at least we can always count on you. Sorry, Miss Ritter, won't happen again, I promise. Don't make promises you can't keep, Mr. Parker. Yeah, but those are the best kind. <laughs> <laughs> what? So you mean after all that bullshit and avoidance of Gwen when she needed you most after her father's death, and you're just gonna bounce back and break a promise you made to a dying man? That's awesome! No, seriously, I mean that. Everyone gives the ending to Amazing Spider-Man so much flack, but this is honestly a breath of fresh air. What I hated most about the Raimi trilogy wasn't the stupid dialogue, the occasionally bad CGI, or the occasional poor attempt at comedy. No, it was that painful back and forth romance between Peter and MJ. They took two whole movies to get together, and they break up by the halfway point in the third. And the amount of times Peter was like, uh, I can't see you, MJ, because then you'll be in danger. Was fucking horrendous to sit through. But now, not even a dying man's wish can separate our romantic leads. Fuck yes. Screw you, you then pig. Love conquers all. biggest gripe. And that is, the film played it too safe. This is the Spider-Man origin story, and unfortunately, far too many plot elements were lifted right out of the first Raimi film. 
You've got the guy who's against Spider-Man and swears public opinion on him. The guy who was under pressure from higher power so he transforms himself and it goes wrong. The death of Uncle Ben. The holding of a heavy object with people inside from a bridge. The humiliation of Flash. The fucking up of the first swing attempt. And I could just go on and on here. And in this regard, this film is terrible. And because of this, I cannot call this remake necessary. However, if we were to pretend for a moment that the Grammy trilogy never existed, and this was the first big budget live action Spider-Man film, I'd call it pretty damn good. Because where this film does succeed is in what it does differently to the Raimi film. Andrew Garfield, for example. I think he is a brilliant Spider-Man. He's quite versatile, handling both the jokey and more serious sides of the role equally well. He's very likeable and has good chemistry with his co-stars. Plus, you can tell how much the role meant to him. He admitted to actually shedding a tear when he first wore the suit. It's nice to know that the actor playing Spider-Man knows the character well. Now, as far as he and Maguire compare, I find it difficult to say who is better because the character that these two actors play is really two characters, Peter Parker and Spider-Man. And I personally believe Maguire makes a much better Peter Parker and Garfield makes a much better Spider-Man. I see Peter Parker as a nerdy, kind of down on his look character, and Maguire just owned that. But when you see him don the suit, it was kind of hard to buy that it was Maguire doing all those flips and saying those one-liners. I guess you haven't heard. I'm the sheriff around these parts. No, seriously, did that sound anything like what Maguire would say? No, I, I guess not. Garfield, on the other hand, is just way too cool to be Peter Parker. At the beginning of the film, it's just really hard to buy why he's so down on his look and why he gets picked on like he does. But when he dons the suit, you believe it's Garfield in there. His antics when he's out of the suit seem to match his antics when he has it on. The one-liners feel much more natural from this Spider-Man, and it's this comedic side of the character I like best about this new version. The opening scene in Amazing Spider-Man 2 shows off Spidey's comedic side very well, and it's great to see this side of the character finally portrayed well in live action. Though if there is one thing this film does a bajillion times better than the Raimi films is, all together now, Gwen Stacy. Sam Raimi's Mary Jane is pretty much the epitome of poorly written superhero love interests. She was needy, manipulative and always needed bloody saving. In the first film alone she needed saving four times, one of which was in a fucking lunchroom. In The Amazing Spider-Man however, how many times does Spidey save Gwen? Zero. Yeah, in fact here, she saves him. I just adore Gwen in this film. She's amongst the best love interests a superhero has ever had. She's incredibly likeable, proactive as all hell, and the chemistry she and Peter share. I mean, you just buy the feelings these two share for each other immediately. I mean, that might have something to do with how Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone are dating in real life, so I guess that was kind of lucky on Mark Webb's part, but the relationship between these two is handled really well. And in moments of a film where I'm usually disinterested, I find myself really invested. But now I want to talk about the villain, and, well, first of all, I was a bit disappointed we could never see Dylan Baker's Kirk Connors from Spider-Man 2 and 3 become the lizard. It must have sucked for him to be told that, despite Judy Dench in the Bond series surviving a reboot, that his character had been recast before he could even get to become the lizard. But to be fair, I think Risa fans did do a great job. You can understand the pressure Kurt is under in this movie to administer the serum to himself, and a fans plays both the intelligent and determined doctor he is at the beginning of the film, and the absolute wreck he becomes at the end of it very well. Had those deleted scenes I mentioned earlier been included, then this would have strengthened his character even more. Though if there is one thing I didn't like about Kurt was the design of the lizard. I don't know, his face just looks too human to me. It should have been more elongated like this. But I gotta give mad props for a fan's versatility as an actor. Apart from the Deathly Hallows, the only film I knew him from was Notting Hill, and I have this funny image of the casting director using that film as an example to his colleagues. Okay, Mr. Webb, fellow producers, I have scoured the world to find the right people to play the parts in this movie, and I believe I have found us our first pick. This man will be perfect to play a well-mannered, intelligent, and determined herpetologist. I present to you, Dr. Curtis Connors. All bad, well chosen briefs, I'd say. Chicks love grey. 
nice, firm buttocks. What do you think? You're fired. I mean, that is one versatile actor right there, people. But let's talk about something else, namely the trailer for this film. Now, if you watch it, you might feel as though it's a trailer for a completely different movie. This piece of promotional material for the film seems to suggest that The Amazing Spider-Man is more about Peter discovering the truth behind his parents' disappearance and discovering who he really is. Apparently, Dr. Connors knew more than what he was letting on, with voiceovers from Dr. Rather saying, Do you think what happened to you, Peter, was an accident? Now this sounds quite a lot different from the 2002 Spider-Man film, with the trailer even highlighting the phrase, the untold story. But as we all know, the film we did end up seeing was nothing like the trailer, and that phrase now just seems like hilariously false advertising. After all, many scenes and pieces of dialogue in the trailer are just not in the film. This life is not an easy one. I've made enemies. Finding the truth about my parents. My dad has 500 officers looking for you. What does your father do, Peter? Well, I never really knew my father. If you want the truth about your parents, Peter, come and get it. Ready to play God? Do you think what happened to you, Peter, was an accident? So I ask, why didn't we get this film the trailer advertised? Well, apparently this was because the trailer was poorly received from fans, so the film was completely changed and the whole finding the truth about his parents thing was moved to the sequel. Which was a bad idea given how unbelievably stuffed that film is. I just really wanted to see this film Mark Webb was originally planning on making. Who knows, maybe Mark Webb might decide to release his original vision for the film in the future. I don't know whose fault it was, maybe it was Sony fucking things up, I mean that won't be the first time they did that with a Spider-Man film. It just sucks that the film we did end up getting was just so familiar to what we had already seen. I still do like this film though. The cast are brilliant and all work well together, it's got a good pace and the action scenes are even better than Raimi's film. With very impressive and practical stunt work and astonishingly good use of the camera. I praised Sam Raimi's camera work when I reviewed Spider-Man 2 but I think Webb one-ups him here. Watching Spidey swing around in this film is just exhilarating. The way the camera follows him is great and when you see Spidey fall, you really feel the weight of his body as gravity and wind work their forces. So in conclusion, this film could have been amazing had it took great risks. But we still have a solid movie here which entertained me from start to finish. What more can I say than that it did get me interested in seeing more from this version of Spider-Man and if a film got me interested in seeing its sequels, I'd sure as hell call it a success. I'm the usual suspect and my next review will probably be out in a billion years. <laughs> Shut up Jameson, writing these reviews are hard. <laughs> I'll see you next time. I will always be Spider-Man. <laughs> Character.